Hello, everybody. My name is Katherine Barron. I'm a longtime education reporter, and I'm excited to be hosting The Score, a podcast about academic integrity and cheating. Over six episodes of The Score, we'll be looking at the landscape of cheating in school and taking a closer look at some of the issues at play in this multifaceted issue challenging academia today. How big a problem is it? Who cheats? What are schools and colleges doing to address the problem? What's the impact of cheating on society and on our lives? And perhaps the biggest question, why do people cheat? We'll ask the experts to provide insights into what's happening in our classrooms. We'll talk with a journalist who writes about academic integrity. We'll talk with leading scholars and educators who have published research and articles about cheating. And we'll hear from students themselves about why they think cheating is so pervasive. We'll also ask our guests to weigh in on regulatory and legislative action and other policies that they think may work to curb cheating. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at podcastthescore, one word, or stop by our website to download show notes and see our lineup of guests and release dates. We're at podcastthescore.com. Again, that's podcastthescore.com. On this episode of The Score, We'll get a feel for the lay of the land when it comes to cheating in schools with Derek Newton. Derek is author of The Cheat Sheet, a bi-weekly blog post that explores all aspects of academic misconduct. Welcome to The Score, Derek. Thank you for having me. Glad to be here and I'm super glad we're doing this. Yeah, it's fascinating. Just amazing how much there is about this topic that I really am looking forward to digging into. But first, I I just want to get a sense of how did you become interested in this topic? Well, I started writing about education uh, generally uh, with a sort of an emphasis on higher ed many years ago. And I think it was actually somebody sent me an advertisement for a company that was willing to take online college courses for you for a fee. And I thought this was strange and interesting. Uh, so I called them up and I asked them how much it was and how often they did it and how many customers they had. And I wound up writing a piece almost six years ago. Now it was a, a check for the Atlantic on this company, but also the many other companies like them that will just pretend to be you and take your classes for you for a fee. And so I thought that just, that just sort of blew my mind. And that was sort of the first step on what's been years of sort of paying attention to and tracking and writing about this phenomenon, this cultural artifact that we're we're talking about today. Well, I was going to ask you what surprised you the most, but you said that blew your mind. So that did blow my mind, you know, but since then it's been, I'm always, I say this a lot, you know, I'm always shocked, but never surprised about what it is that I come across in sort of writing about and talking to people in this world of academic misconduct and cheating. The scope of it, the pervasiveness, the commonality of it is just mind boggling to me. Uh, And also the sophistication, the technology, the level at which it exists, I think would surprise a lot of people and and routinely surprises me. Well, let's start getting into some of that. How big is the problem? Well, I think there are two ways to measure that. You know, one is how many college students might be engaging in misconduct or cheating. And that's really hard to measure because most of the research around it relies on surveys. So we ask college students, are you cheating? Have you been cheating? And most people tend to discount or, or pass over their own misconduct when you ask them. So those surveys tend to be underestimated or undercount cheating. But most of them, if you go back 15 years or so, come up with numbers somewhere between two thirds up to 80% of college students. Uh, acknowledge engaging in some form of misconduct over their college career. So it's a significant amount. I say two thirds and up. The other way to get a handle on how big this issue is, the misconduct issue is, is looking at finances. Uh, What sort of money are we talking about? And I don't think there's anybody who would disagree with the statement. This is a multinational, multi-billion dollar industry stretching across Australia, Africa, Europe, the United States. Uh, There are many companies, many sort of cheating organizations uh, who generate revenue in the tens of billions of dollars and have companies valued in that price range. So this is a global enterprise that impacts at least two out of every three college students, maybe, maybe significantly more. 
I want to say that it's terrifying, but in my reporting on it, I have found similar things that initially just shocked me. For instance, I went to a high school that has um, you know, great standing among high schools nationwide. I was in a room with students who were handpicked by the college advisor, and she left the room, shut the door. I totally expected them to talk about how they hated cheating, and it, it really annoyed them that they worked so hard. And there were these other students who were getting ahead by cheating, and yet to a student, they told me they all cheated. They said, we have to cheat because everyone cheats, and it puts us at a disadvantage if we don't cheat. And that actually shocked me. I was really not expecting it. Yep. And I think the key there is two things that, that you hit on with that. First of all, I'm you know disappointed, of course, but, but not surprised. Uh, one of the things is one of the motivations that students report at all levels, whether it's, you know, and cheating behavior begins in, in middle school, all the way up through grad school, professional testing, is this sort of peer pressure, this competitiveness, you know, when grades are issued on a curve, you know, when you're judged against your classmates for a certain number of good grades, and you start to believe that your competitors are engaging in misconduct, the pressure to reciprocate it, it grows, grows quite a bit. And then the other thing I, I found a lot, uh, especially with students, I'm glad that that, uh, I think you said it was a counselor left the room because what you get from students when I've interviewed them or when you get them on in public spaces is you get this always answer. Oh, I don't do it. I, I never do it. I never do it. But but my friends, people I know do it all the time, right? And so you have to sort of break through that code. Again, getting people to be honest, you know, they're not going to admit that they looked up all the answers to the test in front of their professor. It's just not going to happen. Is there any way, any research that discusses whether this problem has gotten worse over the years? I mean, I mentioned that now we all have cell phones, we have computers. When a lot of us were in college, we didn't really have access to that kind of technology. Did that mean we weren't cheating or we're just cheating in different ways? And is there any research on that? There is, but I would describe it honestly as conflicted. There are research people and academics who will tell you that the rate of uh, misconduct, academic misconduct is pretty steady and it's been pretty steady for a long time. I tend to think it's gone up for a number of reasons. And there are research studies that show that as well. But I couldn't definitively say that there's consensus on that point. Where I think there is consensus is that the nature of cheating has changed. What people did 20 years ago is not the conduct they engaged in 10 years ago, and it's not the conduct they're engaging in now, which is why I tend to believe and put more faith in the studies that show it's up because of the ubiquitousness of it, the ease of access, the constant and sophisticated advertising. People who sell cheating services are really good marketers. They make billions of dollars. They're not stupid people. Uh, they are creative and persistent and really understand the language that they need to use when they speak to students. They talk about the stress of you know late night assignments. They talk about how this assignment really isn't really worth anything. It's kind of stupid. It's busy work. Don't distract yourself with busy work. Go have a life for ten dollars. I'll do that essay for you. You know, and that that's effective. It works. I mean, they're making money. Clearly, you can't argue that that advertising isn't working. I mean, we all had stress of late night assignments. Sure, but I, I so something's changed, and I think culturally, perhaps since then. But before we get into that, I actually wanted to ask you. You, you talked about that the way people cheat now is different. You know, I went to school. Uh, you know, a little bit after people were carving into stone, but still, <laughs> you'd look around a classroom and you knew exactly who was cheating. People were kind of leaning over a little bit, almost to the point where they might fall off their chair. And then the person they were looking at would sort of cover their paper with their arm. That, that was probably the most common way that people would cheat back then. Like one eye on the teacher and, and one eye on the paper of the person next to them. But that really doesn't happen anymore, especially since so much is happening online. Even the tests are given online, even if you're in a classroom. So what's, what's different? How, how do you know if someone's cheating today? Well, how you know somebody's cheating is really the you know, $60 billion question. You know, how, do you, how do you detect it? Because if you can't spot it, 
preventing it and and doing something about it is really difficult. But the way people cheat, you're right, is absolutely different. Almost all education, certainly at the college level and at the graduate level, is is digital. Uh, even if you're sitting in an actual classroom in front of a human professor, your assignments are probably submitted through a web portal. Uh, written assignments, you take your tests online. They're they're distributed online in a in a test uh, server, and this allows all sorts of access to digital resources. People think, oh, you'll just Google the answer. Certainly that happens, but that type of activity is really easy to spot and really easy to prevent. You know, what happens more frequently is students get in you know, group chats through messenger applications and they take the test not on your own as you're supposed to, but in a group of six or eight or 10 people all exchanging notes and answers and comments on the questions in real time as they're taking the test. That sort of thing is a lot harder to police. And if you have an assignment due you know, tomorrow at midnight in your composition class and you don't understand it or you just don't want to do it or you don't think it has any relevance to you, you know, there are companies that will write that paper for you in under an hour for as little as $10. You know, that's awfully tempting to just not have to do it or a 10 spot. How do they do the group chat cheating? Isn't the program where the test is, doesn't it look for that? Can it track, see what students are doing? Well, some can and they do, but either a lot of the systems you're talking about proctoring, for example, don't check for that. They're passive systems or, you know, they do it on their cell phones. So if, if a proctoring system isn't engaged, the computer they're using may be able to know that they haven't gone off of the screen or they haven't gone on Google, but they have their cell phone in their lap and they're chatting with their friends. Would you get on six? You know, is this the right equation I should use on number seven? You know, everybody agrees the answer is 1942 for question 16. You know, that's generally referred to as collusion cheating really, really difficult to catch and very, very common. One of the students who I had interviewed back in that group, uh, high school students, and this is a low-tech way of doing it, actually. They would steam the label off a water bottle, write some answers on that, and then they'd glue it back on, put the water bottle on their desk while they were taking the test with the label facing out so they could read right through the water. I've heard of that. I mean, there are you know, I've talked to uh, proctors, test proctors who talk about people putting answer sheets on their cat. I've heard of people putting, uh, you know, putting every sort of way to get around actually learning the material that you could possibly imagine. And that's why you see now uh, services or companies that do proctoring for tests. And we're talking only about that, you know, try to get you to take your webcam and show your desk or show the room because people do that. They hide the answers in their water bottles or they, you know, pin answer sheets to their wall and think, well, the camera can't see them. So I'm just going to take the test with the answers in front of me and I'll be smarter than everybody else. You know, that's where we are now. For every innovative way there is to get around a system, somebody's working to make that system catch it. Um, uh, Unfortunately, that gets very, very expensive, very, very technologically savvy and not a lot of fun. Well, what are some of the most popular methods of trying to catch cheaters or or prevent it in the first place? I think most people agree with this, but my sense is that having systems in place that do try to detect or catch cheating is the best prevention because every sort of people know when they're doing things they're not supposed to, and there's always a risk reward thing. What's the risk I'm going to get caught? What's the reward that I might benefit from taking the shortcut? So when you raise the stakes that they might be caught, you can cut down on people ever attempting it, a prevention thing. For written work, there are a number of plagiarism detection software that you can put written assignments through that will see if it's copied from Wikipedia or from a previous paper. Probably the biggest one of those is turn it in, but there are others. For assessments, for tests, you know, there are online proctoring services that will have a trained proctor watch you take the test. And so they can see if you're looking at your cell phone or if you're looking off on your wall to where you pin the answers or you're talking to somebody in the next room, you know, but increasingly because the work is digitally done and digitally submitted, there's also sort of a forensic analysis. It's very common now for learning management systems or or cheating detection systems to be able to calculate how quickly you answer a question, how fast you type, how long you spent looking at each question. Because if you haven't taken a college exam online ever, you don't see the exam all at once. You get fed one question at a time. 
the professors know that this is a very complex physics problem. Even the best student, it's going to take them 90 seconds. If you're answering it in eight seconds, the odds are very, very high that you had that answer before you got the question. That eight seconds was just looking at your notes, right? So this sorts of forensic analysis that, you know, you took a hundred question history test in 98 seconds and got a 97% is not very likely that you did that without some help. And so, and the other side of that too is, you know, you, the the class spent 16 minutes on this assignment. You spent an hour and a half. What, what what explains that delay? You know, and then we run it through a system, and it's 80% similar to a paper that was, you know, submitted in a different class last year. You know, chances are, it's worth at least asking whether that hour and a half delay was time someone spent buying that paper from one of the many companies that sell previous papers. So, wait. So, so they're taking this exam. They look at a question, say, I have no idea. And then on their phone, just call up one of these companies that can get somebody to answer the question sure. within the same time period that you're taking the test. Yeah. One of the biggest companies that provides this is Chegg. They have a service that will get you an answer to any question within 15 minutes. I think it costs $10. So they have what they call tutors on standby all over the world. So any time of day, 24-7, if you're taking a test and no one's watching you and you come across a question you haven't seen before, you weren't prepared for, and you'd really like to get it right, you can basically just text these companies and in 15, 20 minutes, you'll get an answer that you can just pop into the thing and get it right, hopefully. Hopefully their tutors know what they're talking about. They don't always. you know. And then there are other ones. I think Jake has this service as well, but there are companies that especially math questions. They don't even go through people anymore. You can use the camera on your cell phone to take a, a picture of the math problem and the software will translate it into math, solve it, send you the steps that are required to solve it back. You don't even engage with a human. That's very fast and very cheap and on demand 24 seven. So if you're taking a math test, middle school through you know, physics, graduate level physics, you can, with any cell phone, you can get an answer to any math question almost instantly. I could probably right now pass a junior level math class at any college in the country with a 90% or better, as long as I was allowed to use my cell phone. Well, I, I'm going to, I'd like to do that right now, but I can't think of a question off the top of my head that I could <laughs> I'm ask. No, I'm, no, I'm no good either. I'm no good either. <laughs> but this is new in the last 10 to 15 years. The ubiquitousness of these services the ease with which they are accessible and really the barrier of $5, $10. I've seen some of them as low as 99 cents to get a question. If you really don't know and you're going to get it wrong anyway, the logic says, for a buck, I'll try your solution, which is why I love there was a professor, I'll have to check my notes, but I think it was at Stanford who must have been a, a tenured professor for sure to be able to, to do this, but had said that uh, put a policy uh, in his class that anyone who was caught cheating wouldn't get a zero on the assignment. They'd get a negative score of whatever that assignment was worth because he rationalized that if an assignment's worth 100 points and you don't know any of the material, you may as well cheat because the worst thing that's going to happen to you is you're not going to get those 100 points. But he said, if I catch cheating, I'm going to assign you negative 100 so there's actually a cost to cheating. I'd love to get in touch with him again and see if that's that's working. My my gut tells me it probably is. Well, so I just looked up, I need help with a math question. There's quite a few popped up, but here's one. It says, chat with a math tutor in minutes, 24-7. And then there's a, a little chat box that opens up and it's, it says that there are two AP teachers online right now, that's advanced placement teachers, and it looks like you actually will get your answer almost immediately. And I probably don't need to say that the odds those are actually AP teachers is about zero. You know, these are not above board business people. Why is it that these companies are uh, allowed to continue operating? I mean, you've done research. You know what's going on out there. Oh, you're not the only person. Well, there's a lot to say about that. Countries such as Australia and the UK to a lesser extent, but definitely those two have put in place legislative solutions. They pass laws that limit or ban this sort of conduct. The US, first of all, we are just slower to recognize the threat. We just, I think, haven't yet. But also there are legitimate sort of constitutional protections about the exchange of information that the government has a really hard time limiting. 
And you do want tutors. You do want people who will help people learn. The problem is that the cheating providers call themselves tutors. So if you're going to legislate that, if you're going to put in policy around it, you have to be able to differentiate what is legitimate tutoring versus what is just giving you the answer for $5. It does sound like the cheating may happen very quickly, but the process of figuring out who's cheating could be time consuming. And so if somebody's proctoring uh, virtually and they're looking at different students or students' images, you know, pictures and video of them are, are being shot, then somebody else has to go and look at that. And usually in these, in with remote proctoring the, through the webcam sort of situation, uh, it's a two-step process. If you have a live proctor, which is really the better system, uh, they will, you know, it's actually, I don't know how far you want to go here, but it's a, if the test rules are you can't use cell phones, for example, that's a pretty common one. Um, and the proctor observes somebody looking down in their lap, they may say, hey, what do you, what, what, what's going on down there? And if they have a cell phone, the proctor may remind them to put it away, that that's not allowed, right? So that doesn't, hopefully that ends it, right? Just reminder, the rules here don't allow that. But if it, if it happens a second time or if it's egregious, they will flag it, right? They will note the incident uh, and and flag it for review. And then what happens, that's the first step. Then what's supposed to happen is the professor gets that flag and reviews that section of tape and says, oh yeah, you know, Mark is definitely using a cell phone. He was definitely told he should not use a cell phone. You know, I can hear the warning. And so Mark gets an F or a zero or a 15 point penalty or whatever the, whatever the issue is. So it's supposed to be a two-step process that involves the teacher. And then the teacher will say, eh, well, you know, Mark's not really doing that. That doesn't look that serious. Or, you know, this is the third time I've had to warn Mark not to not to try to do that. So we're going to have to escalate this to the dean or whatever. It, it, it's designed to be up to the faculty member what, if anything, happens. Do you have a sense of how many faculty actually pursue this? Yeah. I mean, we have a good sense. There are two data sources on that. One of them is from a proctoring company and the other is from the University of Iowa. They independently estimated that I, it's somewhere around 10%. 10% of all videos that are flagged where a proctor has identified a possible cheating incident, only 10% of those videos are ever reviewed. So not even like decided yes or no. This is sort of one of the many odd things about this. You have universities paying for these proctoring systems because they're not free, using them. They are, we hope, working correctly that they're identifying at least incidents that may be misconduct, and then no one's watching them on the back end. So nothing really happened. So also, you know, nobody in this situation is dumb. These students aren't stupid either. And they talk to each other and they say, well, my, my test was proctored, but I was using my cell phone the entire time and nothing ever happened. Eventually, you realize that the security camera in the convenience store isn't plugged in and it stops being a deterrent. I wanted to talk about this whole issue of how does it impact the rest of us mm -hmm. in society when there's so much cheating going on. And in one of your blog posts, you discuss some new research by David Rettinger of the University of Mary Washington and Kate McConnell of the Association of American Colleges and Universities. And they talk about exactly that question, like what happens to us as a society? And what, is, what does education mean, actually, yeah, yeah. in terms of, you know, what ha what happens when somebody cheats and then they go out and get a job so you quote them as saying we believe academic misconduct is an existential threat to higher education. If we cannot assure that our students are doing authentic work, then we risk upending our value proposition to both students and society. The value of higher education depends on sending graduates into the world with the skills and knowledge we claim to be teaching and habits that prepare them to tackle the challenges that face our world. Unless we in higher education are able to ensure that the degrees we award actually reflect authentic teaching, our place in society is in peril. Is, is that an overstatement? No, I don't think it is. I agree 100%. You know, one of the other things I share with people when this comes up is that 
the study subjects, the the majors in which people in which we see the most cheating, right? The, the study subjects are, and these aren't in order. I actually have forgotten the order, but I remember the top three. They're business. So business majors have a high propensity of cheating. And you may say, okay, that's business. That's I'm not saying that's good, but okay, they're business people. The other two are engineering and nursing. And that ought to scare, I would hope it would scare everybody, because that means people who are designing products and bridges and buildings may not have actually done the work to match up with the certifications that they have. And that, to me, is a public safety issue. And then nursing, I tell you, it keeps me up at night. People who are when you are seeing them, when your life and your health actually depend on it, knowing that a significant portion of people with nursing degrees or nursing certifications have cheated or are regularly cheating to get their certifications is terrifying to me. I don't know what else what else to tell you. It it is. And you know, I think it's a real problem. And then what they say about education is absolutely true, because two other points of this. The cost of education, what people are paying either in high school or college or or their graduate degrees has unquestionably gone up because of cheating. It costs more now to get your degree than it did. And then at the same time, those degrees are becoming less valuable because if you're a hiring manager and somebody has a degree in engineering from you know whatever state university and you have a suspicion or you know that 50% of the people who have this degree cheated and can't actually do the work, the value of that credential is diminished. So you have a situation where cheating is not only driving up the cost, it's lowering the value simultaneously. And I think in a lot of careers, putting us at significant risk. I mean, I I did a piece a while ago that assessed the rate of cheating, and it was astronomical. I'd have to look it up at an aeronautical school that teaches airline pilots. I mean, and if that doesn't get your attention, that people who are doing aircraft maintenance and aircraft design and literally flying airplanes are engaged in academic misconduct. I, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> I don't have anything else more to say. We all thought that COVID was the reason not to fly, but <laughs> this is actually a little bit more terrifying. That's right. <laughs> and and it's it's just, you know, what, what those uh, researchers said, I agree with 100%. It is an existential threat, not just to the institution of higher education, which I believe it is, but to all of us who rely on people to know stuff. If you if you rely on people to know stuff, this you should be concerned that they may not. In college, in particular, as you mentioned, it, you know it's it's expensive even before they had to pay for all of these different services. When somebody or their family is paying sixty thousand dollars a year mm-hmm. for a degree, I wonder actually. If that changes the idea of what education is about, I mean, it used to be, I'm going to go to school to study and learn. Mm -hmm. And if I fail, I fail and I take the course again, I get some real tutoring or something like that. But when somebody's paying that much money, does that change the entire, you know, tenor of that relationship between the college and the student or the student's family? I think it does. And on both sides, frankly, I tend to believe that one, and there are other people, it's not just me, there are other people who who share this view, but that one of the drivers for this cheating phenomenon that we've been talking about is the transactional nature of higher education, that it has become more of an investment. It has become more analyzed in terms of money in, money out. Uh, is my degree worth this? What kind of a job am I going to get after I get this degree? Conversations about student debt, really analyzing this from a dollars and cents perspective. And that's fine. But if you have that mindset that, and you see it all the time, I can provide you dozens of examples where students tell researchers and surveyors, well, I'm paying $60,000 a year for this education. I'm entitled to my degree, right? Give it to me. I'm paying for it. And this transactional, you know, I don't, I can't believe you actually expect me to do the work and pay you is, I don't want to know, say that it's new, but I think it's definitely more common and more on the surface than it used to be. And this also drives another phenomenon you see in the cheating space increasingly. And I don't think there's any debate about this. When students are caught or when they're accused of misconduct, they hire lawyers. They are increasingly willing to and eager to litigate the accusation uh, in hopes of determining some closed door settlement than they are 
dealing with it in another way. And that goes to your point about if you're paying $60,000 a year for tuition, $10,000 for a lawyer to keep you from getting expelled feels like a good investment. Probably is is not is not money thrown away. But this again puts pressure on the institutions. Now they have lawyers that they have to bring in their legal counsel and they have to go through legal proceedings and make settlements and this this sort of process isn't free. And when you have cheating at the level that you see it at where one professor, you know, has 300 students in his class who he catches cheating, 300 academic misconduct reports, 300 hearings, 300 investigations, 250 lawyers in one class in one university, you start to see this as a financial expense that the universities can't deal with without at least passing on the cost. And my real fear, and we may get to this too, is that increasingly this just incentivizes universities to not deal with it. I was going to ask you that. Have you interviewed university administrators who say, we just can't go there? Or, or maybe have you interviewed faculty members who have been kind of quietly urged behind the scenes not to pursue things unless they're really over the top. I haven't had any administrator, dean level, provost level say that, but I've had multiple, many dozens of professors tell me that. Here's usually how it goes. They know that once they accuse a student of cheating, that trust, that relationship, mentor, teacher dynamic is probably shattered and probably forever. So they're reluctant to do it from that perspective. Even when they're certain that the cheating has has gone on and they can't sort of let it go, there's an emotional labor cost, right? They have to fill out the paperwork. They have to go to the hearings. They have to confront the student. They have to deal with their dean. It triggers an administrative process. And if you have dozens or hundreds of students going through that, professors have told me that deans eventually look at them and say, stop, just stop it. I, you spend so much time in my office creating so much paperwork, so many hearings, quit it. Uh, and then there's also sort of, you get this from time to time in the teaching community, there is this sense among peers and colleagues, other professors, that if a lot of students are cheating in your class, you are not teaching well, that it's somehow a reflection on your quality as a teacher. So there's also this added pressure from the professor's perspective to, yeah, I know a lot of my students are cheating, but I really don't want to drag everybody through that. And I don't want to have to tell my colleagues and peers and friends that half my class is cheating. Because whether they say it out loud or not, they're going to look at me and be judgmental about that. And I would say that that's not the problem. Probably just as many students are cheating in the professors, the other professors' classes as are cheating in, in theirs. But you know that's just not where we are uh, with that conversation. So that's a very, very long answer. Yes, there are many, many pressures and impediments in these internal college apparatus that place incentives to not find or not pursue or not punish misconduct. You have sort of discussed some of the issues, some of the reasons that students cite for cheating. And we, we've talked about that. You know, they want to have a life. There's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they, mm -hmm. uh, they haven't had time to study. They don't like that course. It's a requirement. They just have to get it out of the way. Uh, everyone else is doing it. And I'd be dumb not to do it because then I'll put myself at a disadvantage. Sure. I wonder how much of that is, I don't know. I mean, this is going to just be some opinion, I guess, but how, how valid is that? Or is anyone looking into that? As I mentioned earlier, we all had stress. School can be stressful. You have five college courses. There's homework for all of them. There's papers for all of them. And yes, you do want to have a life. How do, did, is there something different now are students today really under more stress than, than 10, 15, 20 years ago? Or has there been some cultural shift that has happened to make it just, you know, this excuse become more reasonable in a way? Yes, to both. It's clearly the, the college going experience today is clearly different than it was. We can see that there's some data for that. Like, Hours worked by college students has tripled in the past 15 years. They're working more. The financial burden of providing a university education has, again, the st statistics will show, shifted largely from public sources to the student. So when you say they work more hours, you mean in jobs? 
to raise enough money for whatever for spending money or because they have families what, whatever the reasons I don't I don't know but we we can definitely track that students are working more uh, and they are um, paying more the more of the burden is on them and their families this is new this is this is a, a new thing you know is that causing more stress on them I, I could buy that argument you know is it a driver of misconduct or is it an excuse for it? That I tend to be more on the it's an excuse for it. But again, I don't have any specific data or insight that is unique to me about that. That's just my my gut. And part of the reason I feel that way is because when you get into the survey data on, on misconduct, that goes back from I think the first survey on academic cheating was 1964. So you you look at these things. One of the one of the most fascinating phenomenon to me when you ask students about misconduct is they will say, uh, no, I don't cheat. I'm not a cheater. I, I haven't done that. And then when you right immediately ask them, when you break down individual actions, like looked on somebody else's paper or gotten a paper from, a, from a, another classmate or bought an answer or you know, turned in work that wasn't yours, they answer yes to these individual things. Even though you define in the survey, these are examples of cheating. Have you done any of these? They say yes. And those numbers don't match up. They have you cheated is usually in the 20% region. The actual admitted incidence of misconduct at a specific level can be 70, 80%. And then when you go back and you ask them and you say, well, you said you didn't cheat, but yet you said you turned in a paper that wasn't yours. The answer is almost always, well, that, it, that wasn't cheating when I did it, right? There's a rationalization that comes in immediately. And they tend to be things like, well, the professor was bad. The assignment was dumb. I didn't have enough time. You know, I don't, I didn't want this course to begin with. So what do I care? Right. Uh, so the reflex to justify the cheating goes back to the sixties. So that's why I'm a little hesitant to say that new stresses, even if they are real and even if they are significant are driving cheating. I'm more inclined to think that this is another line that we may just have to add to the research for a pretty quick and easy justification for the misconduct. Well, it sounds like there's more of a sliding scale of morality around cheating today sure. than there used to be. And maybe it used to be, you know, binary. You cheated, you didn't cheat. Sure. But now it's like, well, that's not quite cheating. <laughs> you know, we can let that go. I would even say, and I'm I'm pretty Puritan view on on misconduct, as you can tell. But um, you know, I'm still of the opinion that there are gradations, right? I mean, if, if, if a classmate tells you four or five of the questions that were on the exam before you take it, is that cheating? Yes. Yeah. I think that is cheating. That is not, that is not adhering to what the assessment is to, to see if you actually know, right? Is it the same as paying $20 to have somebody in Africa write your paper for you and turn it in as your own? No, I would say that that is a different level of misconduct. So I don't view them as all the same, but they're still cheating as cheating. So here's the big wrap up question then. You know, what do you think we should do about it? There are just so many facets to this. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, I, I'm sure you've thought about that because you've been looking at this issue and writing about it for so long. The short answer is everything we can. And and that that may sound flippant, but it really isn't. I am continually surprised and disappointed about the lack of investment that colleges in particular make in this problem. They seem to do what they think will get them an answer, but it isn't really a serious investment in, in dealing with the problem. And we can debate why they might, might be doing that. But the other thing I think, so, you know, honor codes, integrity codes, you know, changing assessments frequently, not just in type, but in actual content. Professors who have given the exact same final exam for 10 years in a row are asking for their students to cheat. It is so easy to get a copy of that exam and exam answers in five minutes for $5. You know, we need to really look at our assessments. Colleges need to spend more time and investment on preventing the misconduct and catching it when it happens and being public about it. You know, deterrence is a real factor here. If you say to students, well, 10 people were expelled last semester for misconduct, and they internalize that people do get caught and there are consequences, they're much less likely to engage in that. And then I think we have a technology problem too. I would really like for us, and, and by us, I mean them, <laughs> universities, to go to 
you know, the Googles and the Twitters, these very public, very supposedly responsible corporations and ask them to intercede on this illicit advertising. You may not be able to get at it from a legislative perspective or ask state attorney generals to crack down on it, but you can absolutely ask and put pressure on Google to stop feeding search results into the tops of pages that are cheating providers. We know who they are. I mean, you're never going to get them all. It is whack-a-mole. You knock down 10, eight more will spring up. But there's no reason Google has to be making money on that. And there's no reason it has to be so easy to find so always. And that's the way it is now. I would say to the universities, invest everything you can in, in creating a system and a culture where people don't cheat, but also invest on preventing it and catching it when it does happen. And then let's, let's have a very serious conversation about the role of tech companies in this problem because they have a role to play in solving. And I think they get off the hook a lot when, when we have this conversation. Derek, thanks so much. This is a lot of food for thought, and I appreciate your sharing so much of that with us. Derek Newton is the author of The Cheat Sheet. What's the URL if people want to check it out? So it's thecheatsheet.substack.com. I'm Catherine Barron. You've been listening to The Score. My thanks to Derek Newton. The Score is produced by the Academic Integrity and Research Group at Pando Public Relations. It is underwritten by Measure Learning and technical support is provided by This Is Distorted. To ask questions, to download show notes, or to learn more about The Score, visit our website at podcastthescore.com. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at at podcastthescore, or find us on all the podcast platforms as The Score.